G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy, and in today's video, I'm going to be taking a look at the 10 classic matches that we saw in the 2020 AFL season. Now, this concept might seem familiar to you. I have actually done two versions of this in the past. I did it for the 2018 season, and I did it for the 2019 season, so if you're interested in that, you should go check out those videos. Obviously, we had a pretty warped 2020 AFL season. It was wildly unconventional, but overall, I think the AFL did a great job to get the season in that we did. But one thing that didn't change was the fact that we were still treated to some fantastic games of footy and in this video like I said I'm going to be taking you through the 10 games I thought were the best now this is not a 10 to 1 ranking as such I'm just going to go through the games chronologically which is why we're going to start off in round one when North Melbourne took on the St Kilda Footy Club at Marvel Stadium now, as you'll remember, round one was a bit of an anti-climax because we didn't even know if round one was going to go ahead until pretty much the week of the games. And then, of course, we decided we were going to play the games in front of an empty stadium. Now, North Melbourne were having their first proper season under coach Reece Shaw. And on the other hand, you had St. Kilda coming into this game, showcasing five best 22 players that they had recently recruited. And i got to say, going into this game, it wasn't super clear who was the better team out of these two. Before long, it appeared the answer to that question was St. Kilda as they dominated the first half to lead by 29 points and hold North Melbourne to just two goals too. On top of that, North pretty much only had one fit man on the bench halfway through the third term with game ending injuries to Jack Zeeble, Paul Ahern and Walker. On the same side of the ledger, Jay Gresham did his knee as well and took no further part. Now at this point, you could be forgiven for thinking North Melbourne were going to roll over, but instead they kick five straight to lead the game halfway through the last quarter. The big debutant Max King got on the end of one for the Saints before Cunnington got one back for the Ruse. And then following that, St Kilda had two golden opportunities to steal the game and they missed both of them, which allowed North Melbourne to secure a remarkable come from behind victory. Now, looking at this game in hindsight and the contrasting trajectories for both of these clubs throughout the 2020 season, this game looks a little bit weird on paper and will be reflected on as a great win for the North Melbourne Footy Club. Next up, we're going to take a look at round three and in another unpredictable topsy-turvy game, we saw the Carlton Footy Club venture to GMHBA, the dreaded visit, to take on the Cats. Now, despite all odds, Carlton came out with the ascendancy and dominated the first term, kicking five goals to one and led the game by 25 points. I mean, a lead like that is even further significant when you consider we're playing with shorter quarters. And it really did come out of nowhere considering David Teague had actually been criticized for his slow starts. And to that point, Carlton had only won three out of 13 first terms under him. In the third term, Carlton remarkably led the game by 42 points and Eddie Betts smashed any expectations that he was past his best by setting up three goals in that term. We knew Geelong would have a response and that they did. And of course they came out in the last quarter scoring four goals to none and almost snatched a remarkable come from behind victory. Geelong had their chances as well to win the game with late opportunities to Gary Ablett and Brian Myers, but they couldn't get the job done and the Blues held on for a historic victory. It was their first win at the venue since 1996 and it was spearheaded by Paddy Cripps with 24 possessions and two goals. Next up, we are looking at round six, the clash between the Fremantle Dockers and the St Kilda Footy Club. And of course, St Kilda are on this list again, and this time, again, for the wrong reasons. In what would prove to be the comeback of the season, the Dockers flipped the script on the more fancy Saints to steal a remarkable come from behind victory. It was the final game of a five-week stay in a Queensland hub for the Fremantle Dockers, and the Saints blew them out of the game pretty much in that first term, kicking the first seven goals. Now, it was the final day of a five-week stay in a Queensland hub for the Fremantle Footy Club, who looked like they didn't want to be there in the first term with St Kilda kicking seven goals. The lead blew out to 37 points before the Dockers finally snapped into gear just before halftime. And when I say snap into gear, they managed to kick 10 of the next 11 goals to Bizarrely, then lead the game by 19 points. And again, similar to round one, the Dockers, like North Melbourne, were down two rotations with Sean Darcy and Hayden Young not playing late in the game. The Saints then managed to scrap their way back into the game and level the scores with two minutes remaining. And again, similar to the round one North Melbourne game, considering Fremantle didn't make finals and St Kilda went on to win one, this will be looked upon as one of the more inexplicable results from 2020. Fourth game on the list is the round seven clash between the Carlton Footy Club, again making this list, and Port Adelaide. The Blues were now taking on the ladder leading Port Adelaide, and this game went on to become one of the most memorable finishes of the season. It was a game that was fast paced and aggressively played from start to finish, and we saw eight goals between the two sides in the first term, and it only separated them by one point. Further to that, the margin was still only six points at the second and third term breaks, both times to Port Adelaide. Now, while it was a high quality game throughout, Port Adelaide did almost take every opportunity they could to lose the game. 
Charlie Dixon, Robbie Gray and Todd Marshall all had fairly simple chances to win the game and they couldn't quite seal it. The Blues then led by three points in the dying seconds and it appeared they were going to steal another remarkable victory before Robbie Gray took a mark about 45 out right on the boundary line. The siren then of course sounded as he's lining up to shoot for goal and the equation was simple. Robbie Gray had to kick one of the more difficult set shots he could to win the game after the siren for his club. Given the magician that Robbie Gray is, it's almost unsurprising that he went back and absolutely nailed the kick. Power recorded a three point victory that will live long in the memory of footy fans everywhere. We then move to round nine and Perth, where a previously struggling West Coast was taking on a very strong Geelong side at Optus Stadium. After a poor Queensland hub to start the year, the Eagles were suddenly flag favourites after a huge win against Collingwood the week before. But in this particular game, the Cats dominated the first half, controlled ball movement, and with their tight defence, really locked down the Eagles' marking game. In fact, at that point, the Eagles had averaged 84 marks a game that season and had only recorded 27 marks in the first half and went on to only record 57 for the entire game. The game started frenetically, Josh Kennedy kicked his first goal within 16 seconds but after that he barely saw it and Geelong dominated proceedings to build a four goal lead. Now the Eagles did have a response and in particular Nick Natnui was instrumental in what can only be described as a pretty unexpected rise to career best form. They managed to claw back into the contest on the back of his handiwork and at the final change they were within eight points of the Cats. Josh Kennedy who as I said was well held for most of the day exploded in the final term and helped give the Eagles a slender lead. It would be a dramatic final term with score review controversy and there was a crucial moment in the dying minutes where Cam Guthrie takes one of the marks of the day and then bottles it by getting caught holding the ball. The Eagles would then go on to win a thrilling contest in a finals like atmosphere by nine points. Now we're looking at round 12 again at Optus Stadium the scene where Fremantle famously take on Carlton. Optus Stadium was of course the scene where Mark Murphy had stolen a late win against Fremantle just 12 months before so there was a little bit of feeling going into this game. This particular game was a pretty dour and tense game and is no doubt remembered for the finish rather than the actual contest throughout four quarters. Now Fremantle dominated proceedings early to get the jump on the Blues building a 19 point lead and then they just shut down the game defensively. In particular Luke Ryan for the host was miserly in defence just repelling attack after attack from Carlton but they still managed to whittle down Fremantle's lead to just two points at the final break. Conditions were greasy, it wasn't a great game of footy, in the first three terms we only saw nine goals, Carlton had taken 36 minutes to get their first goal of the game and then after quarter time, Fremantle added just two themselves. Carlton then had opportunities to ice the game late. Harry Mackay had a difficult set shot, which he almost bellied out on the full. And then Liam Jones, who took the cleanup mark, also missed his opportunity to seal the game. With 20 seconds to go, Fremantle cleared the ball out of their defensive 50, and it appeared they had one hand on a pretty likely victory at this point. Now, in a moment that can only be described as a brain fart, Matt Tabata inexplicably gives the ball a healthy push over the boundary line and concedes a free kick for deliberate out of bounds. With that free kick, Sam Doherty plays on. He launches the ball out of bounds on the full, but he's infringed after he's kicked it, and the umpire is suddenly playing a downfield free kick. Now, under the rules, technically, it shouldn't have been a downfield free kick because the ball sailed out of bounds. And then on top of that, the umpire has incorrectly given the ball to Jack Noons to have a free kick rather than Michael Gibbons, who was closer. Now, controversy aside, you can say what you want about the free kicks, but regardless, the equation was simple. Jack Noons was having a shot eerily similar to where Robbie Gray had broken Carlton fans' hearts just weeks prior he was about to try and do the same to Fremantle. It was a difficult angle, about 50 metres out, and just about every Fremantle player was standing on the mark, and yet Jack Noons goes back and calmly slots one of the goals of the season. The Blues had recreated what the power had done to them earlier in that season, and of course, for two years in a row, they'd broken Fremantle hearts at Optus Stadium. If you're interested, you should go check out Drewsy's vlog of that particular game. You can actually see the moment his little heart breaks. Now it's time to fast forward to the final series, and we're talking about Brisbane versus Richmond at the Gabba in the first qualifying final. Now there's plenty of context for this game other than the fact that it's a huge qualifying final between second and third to AFL heavyweights just about going head to head in a big final. But of course there was also a hoodoo to think about. Richmond had beaten Brisbane 15 times consecutively. On top of that they'd convincingly beaten them earlier that season and 12 months ago in this exact fixture Richmond got them done pretty easily in last year's qualifying final. Now on top of that this is also a very young Brisbane Lions side who hasn't won a final in 11 years and of course had gone out and straight sets 12 months prior. So coming up against the reigning premiers, there was a fair few mental hurdles for Brisbane to get through, but the way they responded was magnificent. 
magnificent. It was clearly going to be a great contest from the outset and we saw Richmond take a slender six point lead at quarter time. Now while Richmond had the momentum throughout the second term, Brisbane admirably repelled all of their attacks, soaked up all of their pressure and managed to limit the scoring. Not only were they sound defensively, this allowed them to launch their own devastating attack right before half time. Three goals were scored by the Lions in the final five minutes of that term, including a miraculous long bomb from Cam Rayner and then a classy snap from Charlie Cameron. The Lions managed to take this momentum into the third term and built a crucial 21 point lead at the final change. Of course, as they so often do, Richmond had a response and they came back to be within eight points with just four minutes remaining. Shy Bolton was then denied what would have possibly been goal of the season if it hadn't have brushed the post. The score review would deny it, but gee whiz, it was hot. Still, you can never rule the Tigers out and with their recent dominance over the Lions for many years, a shot comeback did look like it was potentially on the cards. Two minutes to go, however, Hugh McCluggage's clever snap out of a pack sailed through for a goal and sent the Lions into a prelim and it would ensure that the Tigers, if they wanted to go back to back, would have to do it the long way in 2020. Next up, we don't have to venture very far. We're talking about the same week of finals at the same ground. St Kilda played the Bulldogs in an exciting elimination final. Now, St Kilda were one of the surprise cases of 2020. Obviously, having not played finals for about nine seasons, they bobbed up to finish sixth on the back of some brilliant improvement from the youngsters and it has to be said, a much healthier injury run. On the other hand, you had the Dogs who won the flag four years years ago and had been up and down but regardless had the superior finals experience and for a lot of the people they thought this would be the decisive factor in this particular matchup. Like most finals it was a hot footy to start the game, very contested although the standard of footy was still pretty good. After a tight first term the Saints managed to establish some dominance throughout the second and third terms to build a four goal lead. They seem unawed by the occasion of a big final and they were clearly the superior team for the first three quarters. By contrast the Dogs looked a bit listless and it would take them right up until the last quarter for them to lift and really dig deep. But even with seven minutes to go, the result looked just about beyond doubt with Jaron Geary kicking a goal in the goal square to secure a 22 point lead. Almost as though reality had suddenly struck the Bulldogs at the crucial time, they refused to die. And when Tom Liberatore's desperate snap went through for a goal, remarkably, the game was still back on. Caleb Daniel would then be awarded a free kick right in front of goal. And with just two minutes remaining, there was three points the margin going to the Saints. But of course, the Saints would hold on to win a tense final in dramatic fashion. It would be their first finals win in a decade and for the second year in a row, the Dogs would bow out in an elimination final. Next up on this list, bizarrely, we are going for a third game from the first week of the finals. This time, it was West Coast hosting Collingwood at Optus Stadium. Now, the Eagles and Pies have developed a bit of a rivalry in recent years, mostly built on mutual respect, playing in some very big finals and, of course, the 2018 Grand Final. It was a strange dynamic where both of these teams would have been disappointed to miss the top four in 2020 because at some point, they were both considered a contender. It would have almost seemed anticlimactic to play off in an elimination final, but these two teams brought their absolute A game and partook in one of the best games all season. The Pies in particular had absolutely limped into eighth spot, and given they had to travel against the Eagles, few people gave them a genuine shot of winning this one. As they so often do, however, the Pies got the jump against the Eagles with Mason Cox threatening to bury them in the same way that he did against Richmond in 2018. Similar to that 2018 grand final, however, the Eagles did hit back and by halftime had pretty much eradicated the lead. The two teams exchanged goals in the third term, and while the Eagles' engine room had finally gotten up and going, the Pies pretty much had a response every time they did. As hard as the Eagles would fight, guys like Jordan Degoe or Brody Majacek would step up and kick crucial goals to keep the Eagles at bay by 10 points by three quarter time. The Eagles would get the first two of the final term and when Oscar Allen kicked a snap to put the Eagles in front, 30,000 Perth fans at Optus Stadium sounded more like 60,000. Majacek then responded with an absolutely magical gather and goal on his left foot and then Degoe snap just about put the result beyond doubt. The Eagles would trim the margin back to one point but time was against them and the Pies would eventually hold on for a dramatic one point victory that was both emotional and thoroughly well deserved. The final classic match of this list is the preliminary final between the Port Adelaide Footy Club and Richmond at Adelaide Oval. Now the were another surprise team throughout 2020, leading the ladder all year, losing just three games, winning their first final against Geelong, and of course, booking a home prelim. By contrast, the Tigers had finished third, lost their first final, and had to go the long way by beating St Kilda to book a spot in the prelim to face off for a grand final spot. Earlier in the year, these two had played at Adelaide Oval and took part in another fantastic game of footy, which the power were too strong in. With that in mind, Port Adelaide did have a lot of reason to be confident going into this game. For the Tigers, it had been a long and arduous 
season in the Queensland hub. Winning an away prelim to secure a grand final spot wasn't actually something this group had achieved yet, so you could be forgiven for thinking this task might be a little bit too difficult. Dusty Martin would open proceedings in a fairly typical Dusty way by snapping a brilliant goal over his left shoulder. The two teams would trade goals throughout the first term before Xavier Dersma would launch a goal from outside 50 to get the home crowd roaring. Port, as always, were getting plenty out of their young guys with Connor Rosie kicking a brilliant goal in the second term, and at the other end, Dusty Martin was as damaging as ever. It was an incredibly tense and even encounter with the scores level at halftime and the margin just two points at the final change. Remarkably, the lead never extended past 11 points either way throughout the entire game. During the last quarter, Charlie Dixon brought the house down with a long bomb from outside 50 to put the power in front, but as we know, this game had plenty of football left. Kane Lambert would then step up by kicking a crafty goal inside the goal square and then capitalising on a deliberate out-of-bounds free kick hard up in the pocket to make things very hard for Port Adelaide. The power would get a goal back through a free kick to Laddams, which brought the margin inside a goal for the remaining seven minutes. A brilliant defensive spoil by Brad Ebert in the dying minutes right in the back line would be his final brave act as an AFL footballer as his resultant concussion would force him to retire from the AFL. Port would strive valiantly for the winner, but Richmond kept repelling attack after attack, and sadly for Port, it never came. The Tigers would hang on for a heroic victory and secure their third grand final in four seasons. So there you go, guys. That is 10 classic matches from the 2020 AFL season. As always, I invite you to comment which games you agree with, which ones you don't particularly agree with, was there something that I definitely missed out. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate you hitting like, and feel free to check out previous editions of this video, where I've done the 2018 and 2019 10 classic matches. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. I'll continue to make AFL content throughout the summer. We will still be doing podcasts and the like throughout the off season. And then of course the preseason. Again, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.